In 2006, with seven undergraduate seniors at Middlebury College in Vermont, and no money or other resources except insight and courage, Bill McKibben became a principal founder of 350.org, the now illustrious international organization that has coordinated over 15,000 rallies in 189 countries since 2009, all to raise consciousness about the imminent dangers of climate change. Taking their name from the research of atmospheric scientist James Hansen, indicating the number of parts per million of CO2 that we could safely absorb into the atmosphere, Bill and his students wanted to organize globally. All over the world, he writes, people figured out what these numbers meant and went to work. Since the Earth's atmosphere now stands at over 400 parts per million of CO2 and 2015 was the hottest year on record, there's clearly more work to be done in resistance to the dangers of global warming. In addition to the achievements of 350.org, as distinguished Schumann scholar in environmental studies at Middlebury College, McKibben has written over a dozen books, beginning with The End of Nature in 1989, which is now available in more than 20 languages and widely regarded as one of the most important books on climate disruption and its human causes, through his latest title, Oil and Honey, The Education of an Unlikely Activist. Please join me in welcoming Bill McKibben to Portland, Maine by satellite from his home in Middlebury, Vermont. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. okay, yeah, give that a shot. Okay. I'm going to low climb one. Well, it is a great pleasure to get to join with you all, and I'm sorry for the technological difficulties here. Um, I'm, I'm apologize for the technological difficulties, and I wish I was there with you in person. Uh, Portland's one of my favorite places on the planet, but there's something to be said for all of us learning how to do these things in other ways that don't use much carbon, and so I'm glad to be um, working out the kinks with you tonight. I'll just talk for a few minutes because we're behind schedule, and I know you've had an amazing panel there of people with lots of old friends of mine, um, but I, I, I did want to say a few things. Um, today was a tough day. Today, we learned that um, one of the great uh, environmental activists, environmental justice activists in the world, Berta Kacheris in Honduras, was assassinated. Um, she's been working to stop big dam projects, and that's left her unpopular. Um, today, we learned that uh, in the course of the day, it was a historic day. It appears to be the first time in human history that the Northern Hemisphere was a full, taken as a whole, a full two degrees centigrade above the long-term planetary average. That is, that we're beginning to breach the um, temperature levels that we've been saying we're going to do everything we could to prevent. Um, we learned yesterday that the first official climate refugees in that state, an Indian tribe in Louisiana, are having to abandon their land because it's sinking beneath the water. And of course, we continue to talk morning after morning with our colleagues in Fiji, who just absorbed the, the worst hurricane in their part of the world ever, the highest wind speeds ever measured in the Southern Hemisphere. A uh, storm that wiped out about 10% of their GDP, i.e., in financial terms, did about 15 times the damage of Hurricane Katrina. So it's been a hard few days, which means that it's a real pleasure to get to join with you all and talk about the emerging movement and the emerging battle around climate change. That's the most widespread movement and fight probably in human history. Um, one of profound and preeminent reasons that we need to take on climate change and take it on so fast is because of its uh, effect on peace around the world. There is no way to have a peaceful planet that's being physically destabilized. And we can see that now almost everywhere. There was a series of new scientific papers that came out today. Uh, 
making clear that the drought in Syria that helped kick off the current conflict there was the deepest drought in at least 900 years and completely linked to the rapid increase in global average temperature. Uh, when that drought hit, people had to leave their farms and move into the city, and there was no way that the already fragile and authoritarian Assad government could cope with that. And so the chaos that resulted is what we see. And it spreads, obviously, around the world. But the same story happens over and over and over again in place after place. It's forced to take the funds that it would otherwise use for development, for peace, and instead spend them on horrible complications that come from warming the planet. Right now in our hemisphere, it's the rapid spread of the Zika virus on the wings of the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which in turn is spread up and down the hemisphere because of the rapid warming and the more intense humidity of the hot world that we're building. There are now five countries in our hemisphere where public health authorities have told women not to have children for the time being because of the potential damage. Around the world, people are building walls long before Donald Trump ever gets the opportunity. Uh, the Indians have built a 2,500-mile wall between them and Bangladesh because they know that the sea is rising rapidly and they know where the 200 million people in Bangladesh are going to try to go. And there's no vacant real estate in India for them to go to. Um, um, this is boring the world round, and it intensifies with each passing month as the temperature rises and conditions get more bleak. And, of course, this will sharpen as, as expected. The temperature rises another two, three, four degrees Celsius in the course of this century. The agronomist pulled us flat out that from this point on, each degree increase in global average temperature is going to cut grain yields about 10%. All of you know enough about world peace to know what will happen on a world that's two or three degrees warmer and with 20 or 30% fewer calories. That is absolute recipe for endless instability. And so it is incumbent upon us to try and stop this before it can get any worse. Uh, you watch the nations of the world come together in Paris and, and they actually made a certain amount of progress. The rhetoric that came out of the Paris Agreement was pretty good. World leaders committed the planet to trying to keep temperature increases to 1.5 degrees Celsius, 2 degrees Celsius at the worst, which would mean that we'd need to end the fossil fuel age now and go to renewable energy as fast as is humanly possible. This is a great emergency. The rhetoric was good. The actual plans put forward were less good. Uh, if you add up all the numbers, as the computer modelers quickly did, the pledges that the planet put forth at that great conference add up to a world that's about three and a half degrees Celsius warmer, a world where we can't have civilization of the kind that we're accustomed to. And that's why we need very badly to go to work, and the good news is that people are finally going to work. Paris came out better than the conference in Copenhagen some years earlier, precisely because there now is a giant movement in every corner of the planet. 400,000 people marched in New York City in the fall of 2014. Perhaps some of you were there. It was the biggest demonstration about anything in our country in a very long time. And as President Obama said at the UN six weeks later, when people march, we have to listen. No leader felt that they could come home from Paris empty-handed as they could from Copenhagen. It was a great vindication of the role of movements and of protest in forcing political action. But now we have to step up that action in order to hold those nations accountable to the promises that they made. So all over the world, people are doing just that. There's this giant divestment movement underway to put pressure on the fossil fuel industry. And increasingly, it's working. In many ways, it began there in vain. It's a 
raised command of Tiny Unity College in Maine to divest its small portfolio. And now it's now spread all over the world. And when we were in Paris, Leonardo DiCaprio announced that endowments and portfolios were $3.4 trillion had agreed to begin divesting fossil fuels. That's a big deal. It's a big deal that we're able now to sometimes block new infrastructure projects, the Keystone Pipeline, or the great work that people in South Portland have done to stop the uh, pipeline they wanted to run down from Quebec uh, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean, or the amazing work that's going on place after place around the continent as the head of the American Natural Gas Association said last spring, we somehow have to stop the keystoneization of every pipeline that we're building. The same with coal ports, the same with frack wells. Every place that people are trying to extend the fossil fuel infrastructure, people are doing their best to shut them down. And increasingly, as with Shell in the Arctic last summer, they're winning. And many, many thanks to all of you who are engaged in that work. And We'll just need more and more of it. In May, we're doing this large uh, break free from fossil fuel day all over the planet, all kinds of groups coming together to do civil disobedience on the biggest carbon deposits around the planet, all the biggest coal mines and gas fields and things. The stuff that just literally has to stay in the ground. When we did this work even five or six years ago, we weren't completely clear what we were going to do instead to power our lives. We knew that this was not an option because it was going to wreck the world. Now, happily, we know what that alternative is. In the last eight years, the price of a solar panel dropped 80%. It means we're at a moment now when if we wanted to, this planet could extend electricity to every person on Earth, and it could do it in ways that didn't damage the planet. The fact that we're not doing it on the scale that we need to reflects mainly the power of the fossil fuel industry to block wind turbines and solar panels. In this country, people like Warren Buffett and the Koch brothers are succeeding in getting utility commissions to make it all but impossible for people, even in the sunniest parts of the country, Arizona, Nevada, Florida, to put solar panels on their roof. They recognize what a dire threat to their business model they face. And so, uh, the fight is underway. It is a fight with real adversaries who behaved in reprehensible ways. We learned earlier this year, for instance, that ExxonMobil uh, knew everything there was to know about climate change 30 years ago. And instead of telling us, they, A, went to work climate-proofing their own facilities, raising their drilling rigs to account for this sea level rise they knew was coming. But B, spending tens of millions of dollars to build the architecture of deceit and denial and disinformation that kept us engaged in a pointless, phony argument about climate change for a quarter century. Had they merely said, you know what, our scientists say the same things as Jim Hansen. Well, the debate would have ended in the early 19. 90s and we would have gotten to work and we'd be well on the way to solutions now so now is the time to engage this battle and it is a battle peaceful non-violent but very real battle and to do it using all the tools that the 20th century taught us were at our disposal the great technology if you will of the 20th century the greatest technology it wasn't nuclear vision and it wasn't genetic uh, manipulation. It was the Gandhian discovery of nonviolence, a powerful tool to challenge power. And the subsequent development of that technology by people like Dr. King. Um, um, and it is very good to speak to people who are in that tradition and to say that this is the tradition we need now to be calling on more and more and more. Um, I helped organize at the beginning of the Keystone Pipeline protest what turned into the largest civil disobedience action about anything in this country in 30 years. And 
I'd written a letter asking people to go to jail, and, and I stood there after I got out myself, day after day after day, watching as 1,200 and some people um, marched off to jail, and it was very moving and very powerful. And one of the things that made it powerful was the spirit in which people went. When I'd written the letter asking people to come, one of the things I'd said was, I didn't think that young people should have to be the cannon fodder here. Um, they're doing most of the leading in this movement all over the world. But if you're 22, you know, a um, arrest record may not be the very best thing for your resume. Uh, once you've, one of the few um, unmixed blessings of growing older is that um, past a certain point, so what the hell are they going to do to you? you know? And so it was with great pleasure that we watched all kinds of people with hair like mine arriving in D.C. We did not ask people, how old are you? But we did cleverly, I think, say who was president when you were born. And the uh, two biggest cohorts were from the FDR and the Truman administrations. And that was good because, among other things, let the young people who were there see elders acting the way elders need to act and they work in society. Um, that was very powerful. And, and we need much more of that. One of the sadnesses for me of this election season is watching the way that um, young people are again trying to lead in the right direction um, and, and, and other demographics, you know, older voters finding it so hard to follow their lead. Um, but we'll catch up someday. Um, other thing that was good about those arrests in Washington, from my point of view, was that we told everybody, if you want to get arrested, come wearing a necktie or dress. Not because I like formal wear, you can tell from looking at me. I mean, I'm a good Vermonter, I wear a necktie only when I go to funerals, you know? But um, we wanted to make the point that there was nothing radical in what we're asking for. Not when we ask for a peaceful world and not when we ask for a world whose temperature is something like the world that all our human ancestors experienced. Those aren't radical demands. In many ways, those are conservative demands. Radicals work at oil companies. If you're willing to get up in the morning and make your fortune by changing the chemistry of the atmosphere, if you're willing to do it once scientists have told you what would happen, and if you're willing to do it once you've watched the Arctic melt and the ocean acidify, if you're willing to do that, then you're far more radical than anything anyone in the 60s ever dreamed about, you know? Uh, you're dangerous radical, and we need to figure out how to rein you in. And together, that's what people around the world are trying to do. I cannot guarantee you that we're going to win this fight because we start out well behind, and it's a fight with a time limit. Every night, there are thousands of meetings like this all over the planet as people try to figure out how to come together and build the kind of currency of movements in large enough quantity to stand up to the cold, hard cash that the fossil fuel industry can lay on the table. That's our job, um, and it is such an honor to get to do it with you all and to say thank you for the work that you've done and the work that you will do. Uh, so like Christina said, I, I recently returned from the Paris Climate Talks. I was there representing the Southern Maine Workers Center with a delegation of frontline community groups called It Takes Roots to Weather the Storm. And uh, this was a really life-changing experience for me to, to be there um, with a delegation of folks who are resisting fracking in their communities, who are resisting waste incineration, who are resisting tar sands extraction, who are resisting oil refineries, who are resisting pipelines, who are resisting the transportation of oil through their communities in a myriad of ways. Um, and it really gave me a new sense of um, sort of the strength of our movement, both on a national and an international scale. Um, and I, I'm excited to get a chance to um, share just a little bit of, of what I experienced there. The demands that our delegation brought to, brought to Paris were these. These were our demands. We wanted to establish mandatory, not voluntary emissions cuts at the source. 
We wanted to leave fossil fuels in the ground. We demanded uh, a rejection of fracking, nuclear power, and carbon markets, and other da dangerous and false technology solutions. We wanted to strengthen the inclusion of human rights, and particularly the rights of indigenous peoples in the agreement. And we wanted to support community-rooted solutions, including regional and local economic structures that support the production of renewable energy. Um, and I'll talk about this in a second, but pretty much down the line, um, none of those things happened. Uh, quite the opposite in most cases. Um, and this isn't a surprise, uh, but um, it's something like Bill was talking about that sort of speaks to um, the moment that we're in and the magnitude of movement that we need to build um, to, to, to make this vision that we have a reality. Um, so with the few minutes I have tonight, I wanted to say a few things about these demands. I also wanted to say who frontline communities are or what frontline communities are. Talk a little bit about my experience in Paris um, and what this phrase means, it takes roots to weather the storm. Um, so what does it mean to be on the front lines of climate change? In case you haven't heard this term before, frontline communities describe those who are most impacted by climate change and the fossil fuel economy. Um, and this is mostly people of color, indigenous people, and working class communities. Um, these are the communities that are hit first and hardest by climate change, and it's, they're also the communities that uh, hold the true solutions um, that we need if we want to transform society. So I think it's a fair question to ask, aren't we all impacted by climate change? The answer is yes, climate change is definitely impacting everyone on the planet, and the urgency of the crisis can't really be overstated. But what we have to remember is that while these ideas of universality and urgency can be very motivating, they can also be double-edged swords. We have to be wary of rhetoric that tells us that climate change is the worst problem that humanity has ever faced or that it's the most important thing that affects because it affects all of us. The truth is that climate change is a symptom of violent systems like colonialism, racism, militarism, and capitalism that frontline communities have been resisting for centuries. Uh, so if we're not talking about these interlocking problems, we're not actually talking about climate justice. Um, we already know that the urgency of the problem is going to be used to push through solutions that do more to undermine community rights than, than they do to lift them up. We saw this in Paris. The delegation I was with uh, rejected the Paris Agreement coming out of the experience because uh, it was a corporate crafted document that was more about preserving the right to extract and burn fossil fuels than it was about facilitating the transformation of society. The Paris Agreement puts forth carbon trading schemes which rely on the privatization of forests and the atmosphere. Um, it also allows for false solutions like fracking and nuclear power. Um, basically, it maintains the status quo and it's not an agreement for the people. Yes, it was definitely exciting to see world leaders finally agreeing that climate change is a threat, um, but now it's up to all of us to make sure that the momentum coming out of the agreement gets channeled into solutions that are actually about justice, about reparations, about love and transformation and not about profit and control. So when it comes to addressing climate change, uh, we need to talk about building up the power of working class communities uh, and those communities who are already resisting the harm of the extractive fossil fuel economy. We need to look to movements like Black Lives Matter and the Not One More movement to end all deportations. Um, because addressing state-sanctioned state violence against people of color absolutely has to be central to the climate movement. One of the most impactful experiences I had in Paris was participating in a uh, demonstration outside of a detention center where migrants and refugees were being held before being deported. Um, and that you, sh you should know that there was a surge of uh, house arrests and deportations in Paris uh, in the weeks following the, the terrorist attack in November. The rally outside the detention center was so beautiful. Um, we got to hear from one of the detainees named Amir, uh, who was inside, but who was speaking through an interpreter on a, uh, on a cell, through a cell phone. Um, he was saying, he told us, he was telling the crowd, I'm not a criminal, I've never hurt anyone. I came here to protect myself. Um, 
So ending violent and repressive border policies has to be central to the climate movement. Uh, and we're not gonna be seeing those kinds of solutions coming through the UN process. So what did we mean by it takes roots to weather the storm? The Workers' Center recently joined an alliance of US-based US frontline communities called the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, uh, and that's who I traveled to Paris with. We are an alliance of organizations that are rooted in community struggles for justice and self-determination. At the Workers' Center, we're fighting for the human right to health care for all Mainers, and we're also organizing for dignity for low-wage workers. Um, through Grassroots Global Justice, we're uniting our struggles and connecting our local struggle to the international stage. And we're highlighting the national and the international implications of community-rooted solutions to the interlocking crises that we face. Um, we need a new kind of economy, and we need the vision for that economy to come from the ground up. And I'd be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. Cool. Hi, I'm Iris, uh, Iris San Giovanni. Um, and I think a lot of what I'll be saying is going to sort of really echo what Megan has been saying. But um, so yeah, I'm 21 years old, th third year student here at USM. and. Um, climate justice and climate justi justice activism, um, you know, like, what's my role in it? Um, and a lot of it for me is, is like remembering the legacy that it holds, right? Like, when you look at student activism and the, the power that students have held historically, you know, like, that's really inspiring, but also in terms of climate justice, you know, looking at the legacies of like marginalized communities, like frontline communities. Um, and for me, um, being so young, being white, I feel it's my role to really um, recognize and uplift um, this organizing and this legacy um, because um, the immediate effects of the climate crisis, you know, those are being felt and, and are devastating um, communities right now, marginalized communities right now. And so like when I'm at school and I'm talking with my administration, right, about why we need to divest our endowment and like divest, you know, our, our finances from the fossil fuel industry, it's not I mean, it's in doing so to support the organizing of impacted communities right now, right? And this crisis that we're in right now, um, it, didn't, it didn't just come to be for no reason, right? It was deliberate. And like, so we need to really address um, the systems of like white supremacy, right? That have deemed certain communities like invaluable, that they can be burdened with the fumes, the oil spills, you know, like that are experiencing it right now. Um, so, <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Um, so yeah, when I or, you know when I organize to end the fossil fuel industry, um, it's in doing so to confront white, white supremacy, right? And to say that all you know li lives are mattered, and that's why it is so crucial to proclaim that Black Lives Matter. It's so crucial to acknowledge that the climate crisis has displaced migrants, undocumented. You know, like there cannot be one more deportation, right? Like all of these play into it. Um, so it's really important to remember this, and it's really what um, gives me the support in moving forward. And I uh, always want to continue to and extend that um, backwards. Um, and there's a lot more I can say. Um, but I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, it's so beautiful for me to see these amazing young women um, stepping up to do this work. I first met Iris a couple years ago when I was invited 
um, by both of them to speak at the Youth Climate Rally and to see them really kind of stepping into their power as women is just a really beautiful thing to be witnessing. Um, and so I'm so honored to have them sitting here beside me. So let's give them another hand. And selfishly, I love it because I'm tired. Kwe Nido, so Nido Pesks. Nilta Liwis, Wana Hamugasit, Najio Banawapskek. Nalita Hazilu Andayan. Uh, my name is Sherry Mitchell. I'm from the Penobscot Nation, and I'm honored to be here with you tonight. One of the things I want to start out talking about is this um, comment about this uprising, uprising of indigenous people being a new thing. Um, that's mythology. It's an illusion. It's what happens when we have an awakening, and suddenly we see things that we hadn't seen before. In 1934, Felix Cohen, who was the architect of federal Indian uh, law as it stands today, he was the writer of the Cohen Handbook on federal Indian, Indian law, which is still um, the most used and relied upon document uh, in the field of federal Indian law, said that the Indian is the miner's canary, that what happens to the Indian uh, will eventually happen to us all, and that the treatment of Indians is the signal from poisonous uh, from fresh air to poisonous gas within our political system. The type of ecological genocide that is now being experienced all over the world began on the edges and in the midst of indigenous communities. And we have been facing this struggle for hundreds of years in some form or another, and certainly for the last 50 years here um, in a real accelerated way. And the reason that indigenous people are now starting to get the attention around these issues that they had never before received uh, is that these impacts are leaking out into the commons and that other people are starting to be impacted by those things. And right now, uh, the momentum is building because we have a nexus between indigenous rights, environmental justice, and human survival. And so that's what's bringing us all together. All of our prophecies talk about a time when the planet was going to be in severe distress. And at that time, people would rise up from all races, from all corners of the world, and then they would unite to make the planet green again. And so that's what we're doing. We're uniting, we're rising up from all corners of the world. We're beginning to see each other for the first time in our history. And I believe that we're all in this process of mass awakening and for the first time in history, we're in the process of an evolutionary leap, and it's conscious, which means that we have the ability to direct the movement. We have the ability to determine the direction of that leap. And I think that that's really exciting. Um, it's certainly a challenge, but I think it's an incredible opportunity for us to really bring forth our highest form of creative intelligence and um, be able to solve these problems together in a unified way. So even with all of the disturbing elements that this challenge poses, to me, uh, it's a hopeful experience that even if we do not solve these problems and we exit the planet, as spiritual beings, we're gonna exit the planet united. And to me, that's a beautiful thing. So uh, talking a little bit about what happened in Paris from the perspective of an indigenous person who does this work on a really broad scale. Um, I think that one of the things that was telling at the outset was the removal of indigenous rights from the document. One of the things that we've been seeing um, in recent years is that there is a systematic attack on indigenous rights all over the planet. The most powerful attack that we've seen in over 100 years on indigenous rights. There's true termination uh, policies that have been enacted and um, that are being played out all over the globe. And this is all connected to um, industry's desire to move unchecked across the planet. And indigenous people have a set of unique rights that protects them which makes indigenous people natural allies for all those that are impacted by these things. Um, because we actually have lands 
that are untouched. We have protections that are unique. Uh, and the importance of people standing with indigenous people during these times is really critical to the survival of this planet. Because if we allow those lands to be taken, the last untouched, the last pristine places on the planet, because we're turning a blind eye to the plight of indigenous people, then we actually sign our own death warrant. And that at this point in time, it's crucial to recognize the correlation between that and what happened in Paris. It's critical to recognize the attack on the Penobscot River that's going on right now and its connection to industry. It's critical to recognize that the taking of Oak Flat, the Apache sacred lands, and the giving of those lands to a uh, French mining company is connected to the path that we're on. All of these things are connected to the path that we're on. Um, the attack on indigenous rights has really amped up um, since the discussions around the TPP have amped up. If you have um, corporations that can sue states and nations uh, for their denial of profitability under environmental regulation or a number of other laws, um, do you think that all of the laws that protect indigenous people are going to be a hindrance to their profitability? So it's in the interest of those nations and states that are um, hoping to get passage of the TPP to start deteriorating those rights right now. So again, the indigenous people are the canary in the coal mine. And what's going on with these issues across the world um, is indicative of where humanity is going and it's really imperative for people to pay attention to that. So it's heartening to me to see that these issues are actually coming into the forefront, that people are starting to recognize what's happening. And hopefully there's still time for us to be able to resolve these problems together. The carbon credit market is, um, as Megan said, a um, false solution. It is um, a smoke and mirrors trick. It's a shell game. And the introduction of this proposed solution um, in the Paris talks, to me, demonstrated what an absolute sham the whole process was. Because this wasn't about finding climate solutions. This was about creating a market for our air. This was about the commodification of one of the last sources of our survival. They have commodified the soil, they have commodified the water, and now they're commodifying the air. And this is a fast track to the total destruction of our planet. And not only is it a sham uh, because it's creating a market, but it also increases pollution. It increases pollution under the guise of it being displaced by someone else maintaining a piece of pristine land. Because what's happening is that it's resulting in huge land grabs all over the planet. The native crops um, in that area are being raised and genetically modified crops are being planted. They've been included in this carbon market. Um, we all know what big monoculture agribusiness does to the soil, it destroys the soil. So you have these natural habitats, these balanced ecosystems that are being destroyed under the guise of the carbon credit program. And in their place, they're putting things that are actually going to destroy our arable soil. So it's more destructive than it at first appears. It's also leading to the displacement and the removal of indigenous people all over. In self Central and South America, in Africa, um, and now they're pushing for a big carbon program here. And I'm very proud to say that my tribe unanimously voted against accepting carbon credits. So I think that one of the things that we need to recognize is that, as Megan alluded to, this is not just a climate crisis. This is a spiritual and mental crisis. This is a crisis of the heart. And unless we're willing to look at it as a spiritual and mental illness, 
unless we're willing to look at it as a crisis of the heart, we're not going to have any ability to be able to resolve these issues. All of the issues that are connected to this that, you know, me, Megan, Iris have talked about are all related to this crisis of the heart. And that as we try to address this challenge that we're facing, we have to be willing to face that challenge in a heart-based way. We have to bring the heart that's missing from this process into the work that we're doing, which means that we have to really look at the way that we do activism. And we have to look at the history of conquest that our ideologies have been built upon. And we have to start looking at the way that those ideologies are embedded into the way that we think about activism. Because we have to be doing love-based activism, and we need to stop doing conquest-based activism. This isn't about conquering the man. This isn't about tearing down and destroying so that we can just supplant one other system on top of another. This isn't about, I'm the good guy and you're the bad guy. And if we continue to couch it in those terms, then all we're going to do is continue the cycles of conquest that we've been living under for hundreds of years. And that conversation has got to change. So what we need to do in regard to that is we need to recognize that we are all part of one unified system. And we need to change the way that we define citizenry. We need to change the way that we look at the world in regard to uh, these humanistic values. We've been very human oriented in everything that we've been doing. We have to expand our ideas of citizenry to all living things. Um, we have one of our creation stories says that we were born when Gluskop, who is the man from nothing, shot an arrow into the ash tree and we all emerged from that space. What that reminds us is that that ash tree is our kin that we were born of the same foundational elements that make up that ash tree. It's the same with every living and non-living thing on this planet. We're all stardust and water. We're all related, we're all interconnected, what we call uh, Indilna Bamuk. We're all kin. My, you know, Indilna Bamuk means all of my relations. It includes the entire creation. So we need to start thinking about that as we're addressing these issues and not look at the other as our enemy, but as somebody who's suffering from a spiritual and mental illness. And how would we treat somebody that was suffering from a spiritual and mental illness and bring our heart into this process? One of the things that I think is um, really important as we move forward and we're trying to resolve these issues is to think about the fact that um, we've been operating under a truly imbalanced system. There are two energies that are in play in all systems of creation. We have a masculine energy and a feminine energy, and that's not gender specific. There is, uh, the masculine energy is uh, activity oriented, it's out there, it's external. Um, the feminine energy is internal. And so we have stories that um, our clan system is structured upon these stories that we um, are told from birth on up about how um, the woman is brought, and this is purely for the sense of the story. As I said, these energies are not gender specific. The feminine is brought under the skin of the masculine. And what the role of the feminine is, is to connect that masculine energy to the wisdom and intuition of the heart and to the divine, because a woman's body is a gateway into this world. It provides a means for spirit to enter into this universe. And so um, what happens then is that all of the activity, all of the energy, all of the um, external movement of that masculine energy on the outside is guided by that heart-based, nurturing, life-sustaining, life-supporting, life-protective energy of the divine feminine that is inside. We have completely eliminated um, the role of the divine feminine and that energy, that heart-based, life-nurturing, 
life-supporting, life-sustaining energy from our decision-making for hundreds of years. And it's time for that to come back into play. And so as we start thinking about how do we address these issues, that has to be a part of the discussion. How do we reincorporate that so that we move away from a purely destructive movement to one that is actually based in creation? And so as we're moving forward, we have this word in our language called smogness. And what smogness is, is it is a term, one of our terms for a warrior. And it describes a process of holding back the flow of harm that is coming toward you to the degree that you prevent the harm, but you do not harm the other. You prevent the harm, but you do not harm the other. And I think that's a key part of the equation. We have to stem the flow of harm that's coming our way. But on the back side of that is this energy of creation where we're creating the type of world that we want to inhabit. We cannot make a demand for any type of right without creating a world where that demand can be met. And so we as the citizens, we the people, have to take responsibility for creating energy sovereignty. We can't wait for somebody else to do it. We have to take responsibility for creating food sovereignty. We have to take responsibility for educational sovereignty because it's going to take critical, creative thinking to be able to solve these problems. We do not create critical, creative thinkers under the current educational systems. So if we want to be able to move forward, we have to be thinking about these types of things and incorporating that knowledge base to form the, st the framework that we're operating under. And I think that we um, have grossly underestimated the power that we have when we're together. There's one more thing I'm going to tell you, and hopefully it'll take 90 seconds and then I'll be done. Um, there's a, the story, the a Guyana Shagoa that comes out of um, Haudenosaunee. It's the great law of peace. And one of the aspects of that story is that um, Hiawatha, who is one of the heroes of the story, along with Daganawida, who is the peacemaker, uh, holds up his hand and says something as simple as a human hand can topple this 150 foot um, pine tree. So there's, in the story there's a pine tree, the tree is uprooted, all the weapons are placed into it, and on top of that a tree of peace is formed. And so he said something as simple as a human hand, when it's working in unison, when it's all working together, all five fingers working together, can actually topple this great tree. And that great tree represents the lie of warfare that we have been fed. This lie that we've all embedded into our psyche that drives the way that we work, even our nonviolence is violent. Um, in that it's aimed at destroying a system that we no longer feel is worthy. So when we think about that aspect, that something as simple as a human hand can solve these problems, when it's together, when all five fingers are working together, that's representative of what we can do when we're all working together um, so that we can actually uproot this tree that's dying and taking us all with it, and plant a new tree of life. And I think that the way that we do that is to focus on creation rather than destruction, to focus on what we have in common instead of what we um, disagree on, because whatever we feed grows. And we know that whatever we feed grows. And so if we want to actually grow the type of world um, that supports and sustains the dreams and the visions that we all have, then we have to really be focused on how we do that, how we invest our energy. So I'm going to stop there, but thank you so much for your time. Well, as I've been sitting here listening to uh, a great deal of heart's wisdom from all three of these uh, speakers, I've been tempted to throw away my <laughs> three pages of well-prepared, well-thought-through remarks. And I think I'm going to do that and keep this brief. 
Uh, I captioned this, slow violence, uh, thinking of the context in which we're asked to speak. I think creating a climate for peace was the caption of the evening. The images of slow violence as I thought about it were things like uh, leaf by leaf, stem by stem, wilting in Syria in its worst drought in 900 years that led to the depopulation of the farms and people family by family, one after another and another, beginning to fill the cities and the cities unable to cope and protests arising forcefully put down and a terrible war with many factions breaking out, sheer chaos. That was an image. But the slow violence of the drought uh, that preceded it was what I focused on. Just two weeks ago, I read in the New York Times of that uh, uh, the sea level uh, has been rising faster than uh, at any time in 28 centuries since the founding of the Roman Republic, I think around 500 BC. I don't know what happened then. Uh, but that brought to mind a wonderful thing. I'm sure some of you have experienced this, standing on a main shore on a windless, calm day and just watching, really watching as the water almost breathes upward. In just the flash of an eye, it's suddenly an inch higher because the tide is rising. Uh, you look at ocean rise and that becomes a slow violence because of our warming. I'm going to read uh, a section or two from what I prepared and then I'm gonna end with uh, two images. Uh, in the Gulf of Maine, I noted, remarkable things have been happening Clam flats have begun to go dead. Codfish have crashed. Shrimp have vanished. Lobsters uh, are migrating north. The waters have been warming, warming, warming. Slow violence. And it's a violence to the natural order of things, to the fine balances and rhythms of nature. Just the other day, I was awakened in the middle of the damn night by a thunderstorm, a February thunderstorm, lightning, crashing, thunder. And Christmas Eve, I remember seeing uh, a hatch of insects dancing in the late afternoon sun. And a little bit later that same day, I had occasion to go into my art studio and there was a dandelion popping its yellow head up out of the ground. Christmas Eve, beautiful but in context, slow, slow violence. So here's the image, one of the two that I wanted to uh, share. Lakhmagan Teak. The Lakhmagan Teak disaster involved a driverless train. Nobody steering, nobody in control. It had been parked around 11 p.m. that night in the village of Nantes, to the northwest of Lac Magantique. Around one in the morning, sleep time for most, through a concatenation of errors, culminating in a soft, gradual letting go of the air brakes, this hulking, headlightless, dark, driverless train began slowly and inexorably rolling rolling down a very gradual grade, 1.2% slope. Seven miles away and about 350 feet below lay the unsuspecting town. 18 minutes later, that driverless train was careening through Lac Magantique at over 60 miles per hour, sparks flying, metal screeching, completely out of control. When it derailed, with explosion after explosion, the balls of fire were three times higher than the highest of Lac Megantique's buildings. And as the oil coursed, tumbling along the ground 
It poured into storm drains and burst out as huge fires further on from manholes and basements and even house chimneys. Human bodies were vaporized. Some people's remains never were found. Lac Megantique is a powerful metaphor, a lesson, for where we stand at this moment in historical time. Undeniably, though there's a whole party that denies it, this climate is changing. The Earth's climate is moving. It's beginning to accelerate toward a catastrophic and irreversible harm. But this is the point. It's not completely out of control. Not yet. We human beings still have time to catch it, to board it, to bring it under control. How? Step by step. We do it step by step. Whatever step is right for you, whether dramatic and public or unseen and private, one step will lead on to the other. You'll be shown it, and another, and another until collectively a collection of individual acts in freedom, a counter momentum, not towards death and disaster, but towards life and peace and hope begins to take effect. Indeed, it has already begun and we can all be part of it. We can all be part of it. That's the written part. Now the second image, and I'll stop. It struck me listening to Sherry and uh, Iris and Megan, uh, words like a crisis of the heart, a spiritual crisis. I thought of Sarah and my and uh, going to the healing walk in the province of Alberta in Canada. And I had the extraordinary experience of being in a teepee with a Native American pipe ceremony. And in the middle of that pipe ceremony, uh, invoked was, it was not just speaking to the ancestors, but to the unborn, the children to be, spiritual beings in the realm we just barely cannot see but who are there as we are there. The native wisdom knows that. So a child is born and comes into the earth. And by the way, today's children, my colleague of mine, a faculty member, just had a little guy named Gus born two weeks ago. Today's children, if we do nothing about the climate crisis, if we don't individually find that step that's right, which will lead on and show us the next step and the next, if we don't, these little Young human beings are facing something perfectly dreadful where all of the stuff comes together. All of the chaos breaks out. Not just the heat, but everything that humanity is capable of. But here's the picture. Think of how we're born. We are utterly helpless. I just finished teaching a unit of, of comparative human and animal science. And it takes human beings a full year to really get their legs under them, to stand up. When we're born, we can't even lift our own head. Think of the immense trust in one's parents, one's fellow human beings that each one of us brings into the world when we're born. It will be all right. They are here for us. And we learn to put one step in front of the other that precedes speaking. And from speaking, we learn thinking. And eventually, out of that comes the word I, the word that, unlike any other word in the language, pertains only to something that only you can speak. So I think the climate movement is really one among many worthy movements, but it's certainly an important one. And it's so important that we find it in ourselves. What is the right step this morning, now, for me? Because the time of being passive 
is really past. 